Before we start today's video, we just want to warn you that this video contains graphic descriptions of experiments performed on animals, and some photos may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Number 3. Dr. Giovanni Aldini One afternoon in 1780, at the University of Bologna in Italy, Professor Luigi Galvani was out hunting frogs. Galvani was studying anatomy, a very popular medical field at the time, and he needed some frogs for his experiments. After collecting a few specimens, he returned to the school where his wife, Lucia, who also acted as his assistant, prepared the frogs for dissection. She handed her husband a scalpel, and he had began to remove the frog's skin. However, the scalpel had gathered a charge of static electricity in the transfer. When Luigi touched the charged scalpel to the frog's legs, they twitched. Astounded by what had happened, he replicated the experiment, this time using metal rods instead of a scalpel. Each time an arc of electricity appeared, the frog's legs leapt to life. It was as if the frog's legs were dancing. Giovanni quickly published his findings, theorizing that every living thing had an animal electricity a kind of conducting liquid connecting nerves to muscles. But his rival, Alessandro Volta, disagreed. Volta thought that Giovanni's magical results lied in the metal rods he used, not some kind of magical liquid in the animal. In order to prove Galvani wrong, he replicated the experiment and accidentally invented the battery in the process. But the scientific community of the time split on who was correct. And that seemed to be the end of the little scientific feud. Volta ended up having the term voltage named after him and the concept of a battery. Galvani died in 1798 and although the term galvanization, as in galvanized steel, is named for him, he didn't really have anything to do with that process. But Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, wanted to change his uncle's legacy. By the early 1800s, Aldini had been touring Europe, putting on a kind of traveling sideshow in which he would replicate his uncle's experiments. Ironically, using Volta's battery, he would go from town to town, reanimating dead things. In one country barn, he made a headless dog kick. In another, he made dead sheep open its eyes. But the real test of his abilities and his uncle's legacy would be to show electricity could reanimate a human corpse. And in 1803, Aldini got his chance. A year earlier, a man named George Foster had been arrested, tried, and convicted for the gruesome London murders of his wife and young daughter. Foster was probably hanged for his crimes, but instead of being dissected to ensure he wouldn't enter an afterlife, Foster's corpse was given to Aldini. A few days later, at London's Royal College of Surgeons, dozens of doctors and scientists prayed a damp and chilly January night to fill the college operating theater where they hoped to watch Aldini bring a dead man back to life. As the spectators leaned forward, Aldini connected and inserted various metal electrodes to Foster's body. Then the good doctor attached the electrodes to the battery and turned on the switch. Immediately, the muscles in Foster's face tightened and then twisted into a horrific grin. Gas from the audience as the killer's eyes suddenly popped open. Foster's hands curled into fists and shot up into the air. Reportedly, some horrified onlookers began filing out of the theater. It said that Aldini's own assistant suffered a heart attack during the show. Despite what was going on around him, Aldini turned up the current. Foster's body began to buck on the metal operating table. His legs kicked wildly. And then, Aldini turned off the battery. The audience didn't know how to react. Some were convinced the idea of reanimating the dead was possible. 
Heather scoffed that because Foster's heart didn't restart beating and blood didn't restart flowing, that no life was possible. Word spread of Aldini's morbid experiment all over London during the early 1800s. And that continued when he took his show on the road across Europe. Soon, Aldini became the talk of the intellectual class, including amongst a group of writers who, in a Swiss chalet in 1816, challenged each other to come up with a scary story in the course of one night. One of those writers would draw upon the newspaper accounts she read of Aldini to write a story called The Modern Prometheus, otherwise known as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The name would become synonymous with mad scientists everywhere, and all because of a dancing frog. Number 2. Dr. Robert J. White April 1958 A rhesus monkey roams around the laboratory at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. A doctor in a white lab coat places some grapes on the table. The monkey trots over to the grapes and grabs them. Then it ambles back to its cage, climbs the bars, perched up high as it eats its treat. The doctor is pleased, not bad, considering it only has half a brain. In fact, Dr. Robert White had removed one entire side of the monkey's brain to study just how much of a brain was needed for the animal to function. Given that the monkey had lived for two years so far, he deemed the experiment a success. But he wanted to go further. Five years later, Dr. White completely removed a monkey's brain, kept it chilled, and connected the brain to machines to keep it alive. Amazingly, the brain was able to live outside the monkey's body for a few hours. I don't know exactly what it means, he told the United Press International. We have a brain totally disconnected from its body, but it's still alive. Obviously, animal rights groups were furious. They wrote angry letters to newspapers demanding the barbaric experiments stop. Ever the good mad scientist, why call the protesters short-sighted and reminded them to read the Bible. God, he said, had given man dominion over animals. And, with a clear conscience, he continued his experiments. In 1965, White and his team removed one dog's brain and attached it to another still living dog. According to White, the brain survived for three days. Given this success, White's only logical next step was something straight out of a science fiction movie. A complete head transplant. In March 1970, at the Cleveland Metropolitan Hospital, White and his team of brain researchers gathered around an operating table. On the table was another rhesus monkey. The doctors then spent the next 18 hours carefully severing the monkey's head from its body. They carefully cut the simian's tiny nerves, blood vessels, and tendons. Then they just carefully sewed them onto the headless body of another monkey. Once the surgery was completed, the doctor sat back and waited. There's no report of how they felt when, after a few hours of recovery, the monkey opened its eyes. And this wasn't just some kind of Aldini-esque reflex. This monkey, with its brand new head, was legitimately alive. While the monkey was still unable to move, thanks to the spinal column being severed in the operation, the doctors tested several responses. Amazingly, the monkey could smell and it could hear noises. Its eyes followed the doctors as they crossed in front of it. He even gnashed to bite one researcher when he tried to feed it. And the monkey lived for eight days. The doctor said it died because the body rejected the new tissue. Dr. White became something of a sensation based on this operation, and he loved the publicity. He wrote hundreds of scholarly journal articles and appeared at hundreds of medical conferences. And he often referred to his work as Frankensteinish. 
Reporters from People Magazine, GQ, and the New York Times saw them out, as did X-File producer Chris Carter. But sadly, White was never able to take the next medical leap forward by performing a human head transplant. The science just doesn't exist, he said, to be able to reconnect the spinal nerves to prevent paralysis. Dr. Robert J. White passed away in 2010. His pioneering work has helped create cooling blankets used to chill brains after heart attacks and strokes to prevent brain damage. And there have been other doctors determined to finish White's work. In 2016, Dr. Sergio Canavario announced he was ready to transplant a human head, making him something like the son of Frankenstein. Number 1. Dr. Vladimir Demikov In Greek mythology, there exists the story of a dog with multiple heads that guards the entrance to hell. It's known as the Hound of Hades, Cerberus. A Russian surgeon, Vladimir Demikov, once turned myth into reality. During the 1940s, the Soviet scientists had been a pioneer in the concept of organ transplantation. Working almost exclusively with dogs, Demikov was the first person to perform a heart transplant, a lung transplant, a liver transplant on canines. He even gave man's best friend a coronary bypass operation in 1952. He called transplantology a powerful new weapon in the fight to prolong the life of man. That kind of work seems like it would benefit mankind. Then again, Demikov would go on to give a dog named Andreka two hearts, and he was fascinated with the idea of transplanting monkey organs into a human body. He also once called for transplantable organs to be grown and stored in the bodies of human vegetables. Dr. Robert J. White called him an amazing experimental surgeon. It put Demikov in ghoulish company indeed. It was after an operation in 1958 that the 42-year-old Demikov would cement his status as a real-life Dr. Frankenstein. In September of that year, the doctor prepared two dogs for surgery. One was named Shavka, a golden-colored puppy. There was a nine-year-old German Shepherd named Brodiaga. After anesthetizing both animals, he made a large incision in Brodiaga's back, exposing the dog's jugular vein, aorta, and spinal column. Then Dr. Demikov cut the puppy in half. Just behind its front legs, he kept the dog's heart and lungs. Then he carefully sutured the puppy's head and shoulders onto the back of the fully grown dog. Using a special developed technique, he joined the puppy's main blood vessels to the carotid artery and jugular vein of the adult dog, and then he waited. Yet, yeah, those who envisioned this experiment taking place in some torchlit underground lab have another thing coming. The surgery was government approved and took place at the Moscow Medical Institute as American neuropathologist and Norwegian surgeon looked on. When the dog or dogs awoke from surgery, the visiting doctors were amazed. The surgery appeared to have been a resounding, if improbable, success. In the coming days, scientists observed some fascinating behaviors from the dogs. When it was hot, both dogs panted in unison. When the older dog wanted to eat, so did the puppy and they both ate with seemingly no issues. When the older dog tried to shake off its new appendage, the puppy would simply nip at the back of its neck. However, this behavior only lasted all of four days. As one newspaper reported, the surgery was a success, but the patient died. Demikov was undeterred he replicated the two-headed dog surgery at least a dozen times more, stretching into the late 1960s. During that decade, some media outlets mocked the doctor's work. Others were horrified by it, 
calling it cruel and sadistic. There was at least one man who was repulsed by Demikhov's efforts in the field of transplantology. His name was Louis Washkansky. On December 3, 1967, less than a decade after Demikhov's dog experiments, Washkansky became the first recipient of a human heart transplant. During the five-hour operation, doctors removed the heart of Denise Darvell, a 25-year-old car crash victim, and implanted into the 54-year-old South African. The cardiac surgeon who performed the operation, Christian Bernard, became world famous. But he knew that his work in transplant surgery at large would not have been possible without the pioneering efforts of Dr. Vladimir Demikov. I have always maintained, Bernard said, that there is a father of heart and lung transplantation. Demikov certainly deserves that title. Today it can be said that Demikov's research is very much alive. alive. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.